and then we'll get up and practice some of these, the OPA and NPA. Okay, so we've determined that they have an open airway, and now we need to determine if they have inadequate respirations or inadequate respirations. Very important, inadequate respiration is related to you using your bag valve mask, okay? There's a chart here that we'll look at a little bit later that uh, is very important to you as far as taking a test because it's going to give you the answers to the test. What do I do if this is taking place, all right? And so if we're not getting good ventilation in, then we're not going to get good gas exchange. That's, that's obvious, right? Okay, so without good tidal volume in, we're not going to get good minute volume. Minute volume, you need to know these definitions for uh, testing purposes, okay? You have, they'll come up here in a minute, minute volume. Minute volume is uh, tidal volume times 60, right? Because we want minute, the, the amount of volume in one minute. So if we're breathing too fast or too slow, then that decreases, it could decrease tidal volume. All right? It will, if you're breathing too fast, then it's going to decrease the amount of air that you take in, correct? It's almost like a too fast of a heart rate. So there is a relationship between that. And then alveolar, alveolar ventilation or the ventilation at the air sac, are we good, getting good gas exchange? This is probably a new uh, term for you dead air space because any time that you breathe air in and it travels, then there's going to be dead air space, correct? It's just like noise. If you're speaking through a tube, okay, where you're speaking and you get further away, you can't hear as well, right? Yeah. So that dead air space, the space that you're losing, so you lose volume in, in what we're talking about between where you hear and the back, right? So you're, there's a distance there, so you're gonna lose uh, volume if you're speaking, and so dead air space, you're losing that amount of gas over volume. So what are they talking about over length? What length are they talking about? So when it's to get from the mouth and nose to the alveolar. Right, from here to the air sac, right? There's, there's a length there, so you have dead air space. Don't quote me on the number, you can just look it up. I think it's 150 milliliters on, on average of dead air space. So when we look, when we assess adequate breathing, we look at the rate, 12 to 20 in adult. Remember that most of them breathe 14 to 16. It should be a regular rhythm, a good quality with good tidal volume. So they should be able to get a nice big breath in, a regular rate, okay? Uh, we can look at this, we can see rise and fall of the chest, we can listen to air sounds or breath sounds and listen that they're clear and they're equal, right? And so, but and we can also feel the rise and, rise and fall of the chest. Here's where we would listen or auscultate lung sounds. You don't necessarily need to listen to all these different points. Uh, what I do is I listen to the uh, apexes or at the top, all right? And then I listen to the bases down here. Just have a picture of the back. So uh, it would be best when you listen to breath sounds to listen on the back. You get uh, a lot better sounds off the back than you do the anterior breath sound. So these are just positions where you can auscultate lung sounds over to the side. Like I said, a quick reference, I would just listen to the apexes and then, and then the base of the lung. And what you're looking for is the rate, rhythm, quality, depth, make sure they have adequate uh, tidal volume. The, ryth the, the rhythm will make more sense uh, later as we talk about diabetics, head injuries, and different things that causes an irregular respiratory rate. Clear, equal breath sound, adequate movement. So the way that we tell what is an adequate movement of air, right, is we, get, we practice on each other because we're healthy, okay? and we practice on each other 
and we should have adequate tidal volume. That way, when you listen to a patient having respiratory problems, you can tell, well, that's not adequate. That's not what I trained my ear to listen to. Does that make sense? Good rise and fall of the chest. So, the main term that we use it on the testing purposes is inadequate breathing. So, it leads to hypoxia. What's hypoxia? To what? Cells, tissue, correct. Yeah. And so, it also, I mean, without oxygen, six minutes or so, uh, we're, we're biologically dead. We're brain dead, right? Brain begins to die four to six minutes. And when we look, so things that could cause inadequate breathing, tachnia, what's that? Fast, uh, fast, brady. Fast, brady. Well, how, how do we say that? How would you say that? Brady. In, in Texas, we just say, well, they're breathing too slow. You know, yeah. well, they're breathing really fast, okay? <laughs> Make sure that there's a regular pattern, that there's not any uh, abnormal breath sounds, that they're getting good tidal volume, they're getting that good, nice, thick breath in. Asthmatics, they can't get a, a full breath in. Uh, people with chest injuries, they can't get a good breath in, so they uh, lose out on tidal volume. So these are things that can make it inadequate. We have an abnormal work of breathing, all right, where we have retractions uh, in the neck, where the neck flares and you're pulling with the neck, retracting the neck, nasal flaring, the nares will actually flare open, uh, belly breathing, I think we saw the video last year, the guy's belly breathing, okay, diaphoresis, what's that? Oh, sweating. Sweating, right, so abnormal work of breathing, they're working, they're having to work to breathe. You have the different breath sounds, the strider, which is sort of an upper uh, respiratory sound, a wheeze, right? constriction. You usually get a wheeze when you have a bronchial constriction, uh, crackles or, or ronchi, fluid. No silent chest, no breath sounds. What's up with that? Oh, uh, that one's a lot. You could have a pneumo. Yeah, what else could you have? No breath sounds. What else could you have? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could. A CBRT. And I'm breathing, right? Yeah. What else? I'll give you a hint. Asthma? No. Asthma? That asthmatic could be so clamped down, so constricted that there's no breath sound. Oh. Once you give them a bronch, once you give that patient a bronchodilator, you open their bronchioles up a little bit, and then you hear a wheeze. And an asthmatic, a silent chest is is really bad. Okay. Unequal breath sounds. You like you could have a pneumo. Could be a, a pneumonia there. Could have trauma. Right. So when we look at it. We look at the minute volume, decrease in mental vol minute volume is inadequate because we get a, a slower uh, respiratory rate. We have these other things that we'll talk about in trauma. Paradoxal is a, a word that we use where we talk about a flail segment and it causes opposite. So paradoxal is opposite movement of the chest. It's just not moving the way it's supposed to. Sort of guarding that patient, you know, that. I got ran over by the train, he's holding his ribs, and he, his chest hurts, and he's not taking the thick breath. And asymmetrical means that they're not moving together, right? Symmetrical rise and fall together. Asymmetrical, they're moving opposite of each other. Right. So these are things that we'll look for in our respiratory patient. Like I said, fast, slow, nasal clearing, Poor chest wall expansion, the the muscles in the neck where they they tug at the neck, cold clammy skin, cold clammy skin, retractions in the in the intercostal muscles, right? And they just look like they're having trouble breathing. Right? So uh, we know what that looks like. So we have to decide 
hey, what, do I need to give this patient oxygen or do I need to use a bag valve mask? Okay, in life, in, in test land, we need to make sure we're looking at the same thing, right? So here's, here's this really good, good chart. I, this is probably in your book somewhere, okay? So adequate respiratory rate, adequate tidal volume, no problem. Adequate breathing, we don't need to do anything. Might need, might need to administer some oxygen if necessary. So if they're having, if their rate is okay, their tidal volume is okay, there's no uh, outward signs of respiratory distress, what would be the indication that we would give them oxygen? If there's, if we have this patient here, if they have an adequate respiratory rate, they have good tidal volume, okay, so they're adequately breathing, we administer oxygen. So with this patient here, when would we administer oxygen? Mm -hmm. Now they have adequate tidal volume. They're breathing 12 times. 14 times a minute, good 500 milliliters. If, if, no, oxygen, think about oxygen. It's an oxygen question, so it has an oxygen response, an O2 type response. So when would you administer oxygen to that patient? Hmm? When the SBA is closed. 94. Ninety-four. So when the SpO2, if this patient had an SpO2 below ninety-four, then we would probably administer oxygen. Yeah. Okay. So we look at the next one: inadequate respiratory rate, adequate tidal volume, inadequate breathing. Okay, would be the conclusion. They're breathing too slow. They're too fast. Either one. Let's say too slow. And uh, but they have good tidal volume but they're breathing too slow so what's the see the so you have the patient that's breathing four times a minute but they're breathing they have good tidal volume so you would bag that patient right yeah those are the things that you're going to have to pick up on on the on the test questions that's why you have to read every word you have to figure out hey does this patient have adequate respirations or inadequate respirations right so we would Positive pressure ventilation is the same as the bag using the bag valve mask or the BVM. Okay, so great chart to look at. I'm going to give you a copy of another chart to look at, and it, it tells you, okay, this patient would require ox supplemental oxygen. This patient would require positive pressure ventilation. Okay. So if we breathe, we normally breathe um, negative pressure, correct? Yeah. Uh, if you remember way back in the Khan Academy days, when we take a breath in, the chest wall expands, the pore pull against the uh, bronchioles, which makes a negative pressure, okay, in the chest wall. And when we lower the atmospheric uh, the intrathoracic pressure lower than the atmospheric pressure, air will come in. It's considered negative pressure. When we breathe with the patient, it is uh, positive pressure ventilation. So we, we do have to consider these things. When we deliver positive pressure ventilation, we force the opening of the esophagus up more. So if we're over ventilating them, if we squeeze that bag too hard, so if we get too excited, instead of doing squeeze and release, squeeze and release, we do right. Man, I love bagging people, right? So if we do that, we're forcing with the mask. We're forcing most of that air into the esophagus, which is going to create gastric distension. Okay, but you'll see the belly start to rise. And then what skill will you use next or shortcoming after that? It's gastric distension. If you don't, if you don't reverse that or stop that section, 
Yeah, because the patient's going to vomit everywhere. It's most of this air is going into the uh, the the stomach. The other thing is uh, this positive pressure ventilation does affect venous return uh, through the blood flow back to the heart. Okay, so that's a consideration, but we still have to breathe for them. The other thing is uh, airway pressure. That's why we have different sizes of bag valve mask. This would be an adult bag valve mask, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the bag of 500 milliliters. So when we squeeze and release, good for an adult, not so good for a baby, correct? We wouldn't use this for a baby. It would create different airway pressures. This is interchangeable. I can put an uh, a infant mask on this bag valve on this uh, BVM and put an infant mask on here. Okay. I don't know why, but I could, okay? And you could over ventilate the, the child. Now sometimes you may have to have a, you may have a man child there where you have to adjust the mask. The mask won't fit. So you may have to adjust the, the different mask, okay? So you want to be concerned about airway pressures. If you squeeze too hard on this in an infant, and you might uh, create a pneumothorax, right? So we don't want to do that. So like a foot, you can tell it's football season, right? <laughs> yes, <sir. coughs> the Aust they made good footballs, by the way. Instead of tape ball, we should go out and play like tag, bag valve mask ball. <laughs> what? Pass only. What? <laughs> yeah, you're out. You can't even cheer for it. Yeah, I guess you can. Yeah, one leg. Oh. <laughs> okay, we have to maintain a good seal, good release, squeeze and release of the bag valve mask. It has to be connected to oxygen, 15 liters plus for oxygen, right? Yeah. Uh, when you're doing artificial ventilations, again, you definitely want, uh, if the same way with suctioning, if you suspect some sort of airborne thing like TB, you want your HIPAA mask or your N95 face shield, uh, gloves, eyewear, okay? And then we have to deliver it over, you deliver the breath over one second, right? And just squeeze and release, make sure that you have good rise and fall of the chest. The, the patient should start to improve with that if you know if they have a heartbeat they're just like in respiratory arrest you should see some improvement on the patient uh, the patient if that's having difficulty breathing is going to be tachycardic so you give them oxygen you give them treatment you should see a decrease in heart rate right if they're cyanotic you should see an improvement in their color correct make sense okay you, you can still, with a bag, you know, you can have inadequate ventilations. You can bag them too fast or too slow. Remember an unconscious patient would bag every six, mis six Mississippi? Yeah. Six seconds? Yeah. Ten times per minute? Yeah. So six, every six Mississippis, we would look for good rise in the fall. If they, good rise in the fall of the chest. If they don't have color improvement, Let's say your patient's cyanotic and you start bagging them and things aren't changing. What what could you do? Hmm? Yeah, it may not be, this may not be hooked up to oxygen. So you're breathing 21%. Um, right? That's very good. Uh, what else could it be? Let's say you don't have good rise and fall of the chest. What could that be? You might not have seal, right? And then you may have to readjust the airway. If you, you have a head tilt chin lift, you may have to readjust and re-ventilate again to see if that improves the, the rise and fall of the chest. So, like, now you have to troubleshoot. This is, this is not anything different than when we did patient assessment, right? You, you had some issues and you had to troubleshoot those issues, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is the same same thing. This the this has changed somewhat. Cricoid pressure, I'll show you this during the lab. Burp, 
I'm not really sure what that means or this. If you look that up and uh, be familiar with these definitions. I'll look it up too so I'll know for next time. But all this is, it's what this is, it's manipulation of the, uh, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid thyroid area. So you have thyroid, cricoid, cricoid membrane, okay, just to get the landmarks down. So what all this does, either you're using cricoid pressure, which pushes down on the cricoid cartilage, okay, or you might manipulate it side to side or up and down. And what this does is if someone's intubating the patient or you're bagging the patient, maybe you don't, you're not getting that good uh, rise and fall of the chest, you may use these maneuvers to move that uh, glottic opening around. That's what it really does. And intubation, it helps whoever's intubating able to visualize the vocal cords better. With you using the bag valve mask, it just helps you get maybe a better, uh, a better tidal volume in there, a better uh, amount of air. Make sense? I don't know what the little initials mean. I should, huh? I should look that up. Sir, what's it mean? Okay. They're really just the same thing as cricoid pressure. Because you would push cricoid pressure down and then you would move it back and forth till you got the, the, uh, the results you wanted. All right? So they, they put these other terms. So be familiar with that. We don't want to overventilate because the problem with gastric distension, right? And then these uh, would help getting good adequate tidal volume in, good rise and fall of the chest. See how they're sort of moving it back and forth with, down with the cricoid pressure? I'll show you that. They're get, there's a laryngoscope by they're getting ready to tube that suppression. Mouth to mouth. What? Mouth to mouth? Is that what that says? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know anybody that does that, but remember, maybe if that's your family member and you're willing to do mouth to mouth on them, yeah. no, yeah. everybody goes no, no, they're gonna die. Mouth to mouth. <laughs> yeah, like on on a baby, you have to cover the the nose up with it. But uh, we don't even teach mouth to mouth anymore. I mean, you would never do that on a patient. I mean, ever do mouth to mouth on a patient. So, next, <laughs> mouth to mask. It's the same principle, so you have an airway mask, you have a pocket mask, just like we talked about in CPR. So you have a pocket mask with the one-way filter. I wasn't really this organized. Uh, we had, we were in CPR in the morning class, so I had this out. I should have just kept quiet and took credit for being organized and ready. But you would hold this down on the patient's uh, face. face the same way. So you would a bag valve mask, okay? And then breathe in the one-way valve. And this one does have an oxygen port to it. So you can put an oxygen tubing on there and put an infuse oxygen in there. If you just breathe in, in here, what percent of oxygen are you giving? You exhale, it's 16%, right? 21% room air, exhale 16, use 5%. So the, this is uh, this is useful. This would be the minimum I would use to breathe for somebody, okay? Yeah, rather have a bag valve mask all the time. But, Still, even with a pocket mask, you don't want to forcefully breathe in. It's over one second period you breathe in nice and slow so you don't get the gastric uh, distension or inflation as they're calling it. it. It does, you can, I guess if it has any advantages, you can, it's easier to use, but the disadvantage is the fact that 
uh, the supplemental oxygen is not the same as it would be with the bag valve mask. And you're so close to the patient. You're like right there. Uh, a lot of times, like in, especially in the CPR, uh, they, they make these clear because of the fact that most people that go in cardiac arrest vomit. So as you're down here breathing in this, you can see the vomit coming up at you. Uh, so, yeah, that's why they make them clear. Uh, they want you to see that coming at you. Uh, but you're, there's, yeah, it doesn't allow for the highest concentration. And again, you're, you're putting yourself through that grip there. Again, you would need to do, uh, uh, with someone with trauma, you'd need to keep the head in line, right? See, this, this person here is doing a, I used to work for them, uh, doing a uh, head tilt chin lift, right? So if you had someone with trauma to it, then you would do it in line uh, stabilization. There's some pictures here. Oh, hang on, let me get to it. Don't look, you have a seizure. Someone with trauma, you would do an inline, even with the back valve mask, you would do it inline here, holding the C-spine. With See that how they're holding C-spine with your knee? Or you have another person holding C-spine. So you would do that with the pocket mask as well. Uh, make sure that you maintain the C-spine. All right, questions there? Everybody good? All right, let's talk about the airway devices. So you have the oxygen cylinder that we'll talk about first. There's three ways that you want to identify the oxygen cylinder. And the first way is the color. It's The colors are green and silver, right? It's either completely green or completely silver. So that's one way to determine that this is an oxygen cylinder. The, the other way is uh, it says oxygen on it, right? There's a label on the bottle that says oxygen. So the, uh, yeah, but it's, you look over here and it says USP. That stands for US Pharmacopeia. So uh, oxygen is a drug, one of the drugs that you're administering, see that you're able to administer. So it, like any medication or drug, it has to have a prescription, right? You can't buy this at Kroger. Anyway, so it's, you identify it by the color. It's either completely green or silver. All right, it says oxygen, USP, which means it's medical grade oxygen. Medical grade oxygen is dry. So it's really filtered out. And the third way is the neck, the two-pin index system on the neck. Uh, people use oxygen for welding, okay? So, but it wouldn't have USP on it, and it wouldn't have the neck. The neck is different than what's on, uh, like a welding oxygen. And then the two-pin index. So the color, the label, and the two-pin. You have a regulator that regulates the flow of oxygen out of the cylinder, and it has two pins in here with a, with a seal, sort of an O-ring, and a big spring here. So when you turn up the liters per minute, on the, you're, you're getting the, the amount of oxygen that you want to deliver, it moves that spring in and out uh, to, to regulate the, the flow. Because this is under quite a bit of pressure here, a full oxygen bottle is under uh, 3,000 PSI. So on your gauge here, it's measured in PSI, so this gauge is telling you how much oxygen is in the bottle. So you'll need a regulator in order to breathe. This particular one doesn't have a, most of them have, have a, uh, a little flip thing like this, so you don't need this oxygen key. If you get an older bottle like that one with the neck, you might need an oxygen key, something to open the cylinder up. This is a testable skill. So when you go to uh, test this skill, uh, 
uh, the first thing you would do is open the airway bottle, the oxygen bottle, and make sure you remove all the uh, dust. Okay, and this is why you can't breathe this. So <laughs> Can't breathe that. Okay, so you have to have something to help you breathe that. So you put the regulator, hence regulator, right? So you take this, you line up the pins, you hand tighten. Now you open it. Ready? Okay. So now, when you turn the liter, let's say we're putting on nasal cannula, and I'm turning to three liters per minute. Better? Breathe out of that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you never want to leave the cylinder upright, unattended. We might watch the video again, the, the one with all the explosions. Okay. Uh, it creates a missile if this falls over and the neck breaks. So this. The cylinder always lays down flat, uh, and you want to make sure it doesn't roll around as well. This is a D cylinder, the one that it's portable. You have a C cylinder, which is smaller. Uh, an E cylinder, which you see in the hospital, the big skinny ones, okay? And then an H cylinder is going to be uh, mounted in the ambulance uh, on the outside compartment. Oh, well, um, uh, they could carry it probably a C cylinder. Some of those are not actually oxygen; they're just like air. You can't get the the little there's a little old generator in there that uh, produces oxygen. You know, if they're like emphysema patients, they only need a couple of liters. So most of the time, they carry the little. Like a C cylinder. Alright. Everybody good with the cylinder? Oxygen cylinder? I think so. Okay. So let's look at the nasal cannula first. The nasal cannula is probably the, the most common uh, airway sort of uh, delivery device because we have to have a way to deliver it from the bottle to the patient, right? Yeah. So this, the oxygen tubing obviously would be plugged into the the tree on here. You don't have to shove this all the way up. You just put it on a little bit, okay? I've seen it where people pushed it all the way up there and we had to cut it off. You can't pull it out. There's little grips on there. So you just put it on there just slightly, okay? The nasal can just like anything, any medication, you have uh, indication, contraindication, a dose, side effect, right? So this is the way we'll look at uh, oxygen. Now we breathe 21%, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if we breathe 21%, and now we're breathing, you want to give them more, what is that called? So you're breathing, you're already breathing ox oxygen, you're breathing 21%, okay? But now you're having some respiratory distress or something. I'm going to give you oxygen. I'm giving you what? Fraction. Extra oxygen, right? Or supplemental. It's extra supplemental oxygen. So this is what this is considered, supplemental. It's, it's extra, okay? And what you're doing is you have what's called the FiO2. Okay. Fraction inspired oxygen, okay? So you're increasing... By using these, you're, in, you're increasing the FiO2. What is our FiO2 right now? About 21%. <laughs> so if I place this nasal cannula on the patient, I'm increasing their FiO2 24 to 40% by placing them on the nasal cannula. <coughs> so increasing the FiO2 24 to 40 percent by placing them on the nasal cannula. The dose, right? Oxygen is measured in liters per minute and that uh, is abbreviated with all the little letters. Liters per minute. So it's uh, two to six liters per minute is the dose. 
for the nasal cannula. The indication is the patient with mild respiratory distress. They're not using retractions, they're not belly breathing, they're not breathing out their mouth, they just have mild respiratory distress. They're sort of like that first patient we talked about. Maybe their SpO2 is around 92 or something. So you give them a little supplemental oxygen to bring their SpO2 up, but they have good tidal volume, a good rate, everything, right? You would place it on the patient, the prongs in the nose, right? And then around, okay, in, in the nose like that, then attach this to the oxygen. Two to six is the dose, except that in, in textbooks, this is what you're gonna see, it's two to six liters per minute, okay? Really, you would never go more than four because it's just uncomfortable. Six liters is actually uncomfortable for the patient. Uh, starts to blow the boogers back in the nose and it gets really dry too. Oxygen is super dry. That's why sometimes you can uh, humidify it. You can put it to water, okay? And uh, it, I got a picture later that you do that. So oxygen, nasal cannula, indication, mild respiratory distress, increases the SO2 24 to 40%. Two to six liters per minute is the dose. Uh, we'll talk about some relative contraindications later, but not, not really too many, okay? The next one you may see, I don't really have a true simple face mask, but it, it looks like this with an oxygen tubing coming out of it, okay? So uh, in this you would place, the indication would be someone with moderate respiratory distress. Maybe they're having a little retraction, maybe they're mouth breathing, okay? So you might put them on a uh, simple face mask for moderate respiratory distress, but the thing with it is that they don't really carry these anymore because of the cost. They, they sort of ditched these, and now we just, instead of buying an extra mask, we just put it on a non-rebreather, okay? The next one we'll talk about. So simple face mask increases their FO2, probably about 40 to 60 percent, okay, and the liter flow is 6 to 10 liters per minute for a simple face mask. Sometimes you'll see these with kids. They, they put simple face masks on kiddos, but rarely on an adult. Most of the time they put, a, put them on a non-rebreather. Since I have this in my hand, we'll talk about it, okay. Any wheezers? Yeah, asthma, you know what this is then. The nebulized mask, right? When we get in respiratory emergencies, we'll talk about this. Hopefully, you've been in, through little respiratory rotations, right? You've seen this, right? Everybody go, yeah. Surely you've seen this. Okay, play. They put the albuterol in here, the medicine in here. Uh, attach this mask to the patient. Right? So over the ears and glasses, here, out, <laughs> in, like that. And then what they do is they would turn it on to about six liters per minute. The medicine inside will mist, okay, it will nebulize, it will mist, and the patient breathes it in, okay? So a nebulized mask. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more with, with respiratory emergencies. The next mask that we'll talk of is the non-rebreather, okay? It's a non-rebreather because of the fact that you breathe less carbon dioxide, okay? Uh, you do that by these valves in here. You see the, the little valves on the side of the mask here, and there's one on the inside as well. Uh, you have the reservoir bag and then the oxygen tubing. Now, the indication for a non-rebreather would be someone in severe respiratory distress. Uh, it will increase the FiO2 uh, 90 to 95 percent, okay. and the dose of the liter flow is 10 to 15 liters per minute. Now the way that this particular one works is that uh, you breathe in for the patient, or the, you fill the reservoir bag, okay, and then after the reservoir bag is full, then you put it on the patient's face. On TV, you see this on the, on the patients like so, right? With this bald paw, 
what we'll do a violation of the standard of care uh, because you want to make sure that this bag is inflated because when they take a breath in what happens here is this valve opens up and they breathe in this oxygen right this valve closes when they breathe in it adheres these two small valves and they close to keep carbon dioxide out so when they breathe in they're breathing in 100 percent oxygen almost Okay, that's what we want them to do from the reservoir bag. Your goal is not to allow the reservoir bag to deflate. So let's say you had it up to 10 liters per minute and the, the patient is breathing in and it crumpled all up like that. What, what would you do? Raise the reservoir bag. Yeah, you have the up 15 liters probably, right? To keep the reservoir bag inflated. It can deflate a little bit, but not more than about a third. You want to keep it two thirds inflated. So you, uh, this when they uh, take a breath in, oxygen comes out here. These close off, and then when they exhale, this closes off, and the carbon dioxide goes out through the side. That's the best case. Okay, we're still breathing in some carbon dioxide. We're still going to mix mix those gases together. Okay, but uh, it's. It's pretty close. It increases the FiO2 95 to uh, 90 to 95 percent, right? So, uh, severe respiratory distress, someone that's cyanotic but has good adequate tidal volume, use a non rebreather. Someone cyanotic but has poor tidal volume, what would we do? Hmm? So, we have a patient with adequate tidal volume, but they're cyanotic, so we can use a non-rebreather, okay? What about a patient with, uh, that's cyanotic with inadequate tidal volume? Bag valve mask. Bag valve mask, right, clogged with pressure ventilation. Any, any questions over the non-rebreather? You said 10 to 15 liters per minute? Yeah, 10 to 15 liters per minute. Uh, very common, commonly used, okay? The last one that we'll talk about is the non-rebreather, okay? Uh, no, bag valve mask, okay? So you have the bag, that little orange thing is the, the valve and then the mask, right? So the indication for a bag valve mask to use this, someone with inadequate tidal volume, inadequate respiration, okay? But we make it a little simpler than that. We, we're saying someone that's in respiratory arrest, use, bag, use the bag valve mask. Someone that's pending respiratory failure, okay, so uh, they're, they're about to stop breathing, you would use the bag valve mask. Maybe they're breathing too slow, about showing respiratory failure, okay, or uh, someone that you want to take control of their respiration. They might be breathing too fast or too slow. And you want to bag the use the clogs of pressure ventilation. So primarily, someone that's not breathing, and someone that's about to stop breathing, or pending respiratory failure or respiratory failure. And you can use it with patients with extreme respiratory failure to try to, like if they're breathing too fast, you can try to breathe for them a little bit and try to uh, slow their breathing down with it. So. The dose for this is probably about 15 liters. The same type reservoir bag, you want to keep your reservoir bag full, okay? And uh, if 15 liters should do it, or you could go for 20 liters, 15 plus, right? But about 15 liters would do that. Increases the FiO2 95 to 100%, all right? And uh, this is, you have to, this is the one we just talked about. You have to have a good seal, right? Squeeze and release, right? Not over and fight, squeeze and release. We'll practice this in a few minutes. Any, any questions there? Everybody okay with that? The bag valve mask? It's, it's very important that you know the FiO2, the liter flow indications of these, okay, you'll, see, you'll definitely see that again.
one thing that is new that we definitely didn't talk about uh, last year. What's this called? Find this picture. What's it called again? Oh, the flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device. What? what? Flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation mm -hmm. device or a demand. Okay. These came back out. You know what the reason I have this one? Any guesses why I have this? No, it works. Huh? It's because someone, uh, I dug it out of the trash can. Nobody uses these anymore. Uh, whoops, let's turn off the bottle. And so when I saw it in the trash can, I, I picked it up. Somewhere, because remember we, we whoop, drained that off. We teach a national curriculum, right? So somewhere beyond Texas, somebody still uses these things. Nobody does here. They have several problems. When they initially came out, it was pretty cool because you, uh, you have hold that thing. You can have your mask, okay, and you put this on your mask, and you you get your good seal, and you push the button and it breathes for you, okay? In theory, that's pretty cool, okay? So uh, later as they started using these things, they realized, oh yeah, by the way, you can't control the volume or the, com uh, hang on, hold a moment. The bag compliance with this, there's no compliance. You push the button and the air comes out, okay? The difference here, The difference here with the back valve mask, if I'm squeezing and releasing, I'm doing this, if something, let's say a bunch of mucus gets in there, I can tell it because all of a sudden now it gets hard to bag, hard to squeeze, okay? That's called poor bag compliance. And so as it gets harder to squeeze, I can feel that, right? So I know something's wrong. When I'm using this, I can't feel that. I push the button, the air goes in. Okay, so I can't tell bad. Com I can't tell compliance with this. So that was one of the problems. And the other problem with it was overinflation. It would overinflate the lungs. It sends out a certain volume. If I can get this to work without blowing up. Just a little chemistry experiment here. Anyhow, that's this device that uh, not, not too many people use, use this anymore for those reasons that they, they have complications for them, okay? Two pins, two holes. So keep in mind what what this this device is here, okay? Almost done. Hang in there. Let's go over a couple more things. You have a different mask. You have CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. So you have a CPAP, a mask, that uh, we have seen in the hospital setting. Because 
uh, for sure, right? Has everybody seen these in the hospital? They put them on the here and they push. They have uh, the, the, the setup here. Now in the hospital, it could be CPAP or BiPAP, okay? CPAP is continuous, BiPAP is, that works with the patient's respiration, it's different pressures, okay? There's a gauge on it to tell you how much. Usually it's like, and it's measured in cc's per water, I think it's like 10 cc's. Uh, the, here's the gauge that you just uh, put that up to. CPAP is great with emphysema patients, uh, CHF patients, because it forces air in. It forces air down when they might have some constriction. And what happens is it keeps this patient from being intubated so fast. Before CPAP, we would tube them. We have this patient, severe respiratory distress, pending respiratory failure, we intubate them, okay? And with emphysema patients, it's very hard to get them off of the ventilator. So the, when they came up with the CPAP, this just keeps us from having to intubate the patient. Uh, it's, it's just like putting on any other mask, except that, you know, it has to be tight. You, you tighten up with the Velcro straps, and you, you push it on like it's like you're trying to uh, smother your mother-in-law or something, or your, uh, that old boyfriend that did you wrong. You, you put it, <laughs> you tighten it up there, okay? And, because uh, you want a good seal, just like a bag valve mask. So CPAP, uh, there's some indications and contraindications we'll, we'll read about as we go uh, through respiratory emergencies, but this is the CPAP continuous positive airway pressure. And we'll, like I say, we'll deal with this uh, during respiratory. And then the, this is the last thing that we'll talk about is the, and I don't know why it's actually in the EMT book, but it is, so as soon as I find my clicker, we will fast forward talk about it and then don't look you might have a seizure there we go since there's a picture of it the automatic transport ventilator okay it's very I've, I've transported a gazillion patients on this before and it's very easy to set up okay it keeps you from having to uh, use the bag valve mask they can regulate gas flow in there 50 100 uh, percent a lot the well, no, they can't. This is not, it won't regulate. It just regulates tidal volume, inspiratory time, and uh, breaths per minute. So the, the transport vent, it delivers 100% oxygen. It doesn't overinflate. They're, they're fairly safe for people to use. It is, it's very easy to, uh, to hook up. One end goes to the, that, uh, section on the wall, the ambulance, that hooks into the oxygen cylinder, and the other end to the, uh, to the endotracheal tube with the mask, okay? Preferably the endotracheal tube. So it would keep them from having to, you ventilate the patient. So what you do, you, when, when you set this auto vent up, you select the breaths per minute. So if they're unconscious, you might start at 10. There's only two inspiratory times for the child and adult, and then the tidal volume. So you would start your tidal, if it's an average person, you might start the tidal volume at uh, 500 milliliters, right? And then you can set them up on this vent. It's not a very good vent as far as vent goes because you can't mix gases and you can't do these other things. But again, that's not an EMT skill, so I'm not really sure why they uh, we put that, that this vent on there. I, I don't know any places that would allow an EMT to transport a vent to vent patients. I think you would have to be a paramedic. I could be wrong. They may do it up north somewhere. Uh, let's see, CPAP. There's a picture of that for us. Uh, get over CPAP. Uh, 
talked about. Decreases the work of breathing because it's forcing air in. Helps displace fluid and alveoli in left ventricle failure. So in left heart failure, that CHF helps displace the, the fluid, helps them breathe a little bit more. And then this is how it's measured in centimeters per water. The two 20, but most of the time you, you set it around 10, okay? So like I said, you just tit titrate that. Y'all know what titrate means? You, you start at a little, and then if that's not working, you add a little bit more, okay? okay. And it's all dependent upon protocol. They do have to be awake, maintain their own airway. Uh, and they would be in quite a bit of respiratory distress. Here are the indications, CHF, pulmonary event, COPD, like emphysema, asthma, like in the kiddo, pneumonia perhaps. Hypotension, because it does decrease uh, venous return, okay, and intrathoracic pressure, which would worsen the blood pressure problem. Blah, 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 we'll talk about that during the, when we actually do it in the lab. You definitely want them on uh, uh, SpO2 if uh, you have in tidal CO2 detection. That would be uh, that would be better. Yeah, definitely watch out for gastric distension, uh, and they may not tolerate tolerate it because it feels like you're suffocating them. You know, okay. bypass biphasic airway pressure level. It it adds different pressures. Uh, on the ambulance, you do CPAP. You would have to have a, uh, a machine to do BiPAP. Okay. Oh, one more thing, I believe. The stoma. When we ventilate a stoma, a tracheostomy tube, there's that guy that has the stoma. He's, that's how he breathes through there. Uh, some ambulances carry uh, special masks that go over there. Uh, uh, special devices that would go in there to oxygenate or ventilate the patient. I think there's a picture, yeah. That would, that you'd have that set up uh, like that. These hubs are interchangeable here as well. So you ventilate through the stoma. You will need the, the suction. The, those guys with the stomas, man, they create a lot of Long butter. Oof. I mean, egg, raw egg, lung butter coming up. They don't because uh, they, they probably don't have a cough reflex. So they have a real hard time. You might have to suction the stoma. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put my mouth to stoma, right? Hmm? Negative. Uh -oh, no. <laughs> Not a chance. Okay, move on. Wait, uh, yeah, don't make enough money for that. We have a whole section on pediatrics with uh, diff different background masks, different volumes, okay. People with facial injuries, different uh, facial fractures, uh, you got bleeding, you got these different fractures. We'll see pictures when we talk about trauma on the difficulties of, of using the bag valve mask. Remember the guy who shot his face off? Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that, how to bag, bag him. I mean, you would be expected to do something. All right. Let's see if it's good there. Dental. Uh, if they have dentures, remove their dentures. Keep them for the patient. Uh, they get hacked off when you lose the teeth. Okay. I want to get, you can calculate if, if you have a long distance transport, and I've had to do this before, 
where you calculate the amount of oxygen that you're going to use because you don't want to, if you're transporting patients from Dallas to El Paso, you don't want to run out of oxygen, so you calculate the amount of oxygen that you're going to use, and there's a formula for it. I can't see any need for that right now. Okay. Of course, we don't smoke near uh, cylinders. We know they're, they're under pressure, right? So this is how we would, if you were to do humidified oxygen, and people do humid, humidified oxygen if they're on it for a long period of time, right? So long term, you know, if they're on a nasal cannula for a long period of time or non breather, they're humidified, so it's just not so dry. Sometimes you may have to transport that with you, so you it just screws onto the uh, the regulator inside the ambulance here. It doesn't necessarily screw onto the the bottle. But you would wait to get the ambulance and, and put it in there and, and deliver humidified oxygen. All right. Let's see, how's it doing? We'll do all this later. See the difference in the simple face mask and the, and the non breather. Especially the the venturi mask is sort of old. Yeah, you primarily seen these in the hospital. They don't really carry too much on the ambulance anymore. But see this piece right here. They're, the venturi mask is made up for the emphysema patient uh, that needs to have a limited amount of percentage of oxygen given to them. So these spacers down here limit the, the percent of oxygen, the FiO2, going into the patient. So they're primarily used for uh, emphysema patients. But I can't even remember when we carried a venturi mask. It's been too many decades. All right? Everybody good? Questions?